This episode is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, organizers of the 23rd annual Learn to Homebrew Day, coming up on Saturday, November 6th. Learn to Homebrew Day is an opportunity to celebrate and spread the joy of the most rewarding and delicious hobby of all time. To encourage new and longtime homebrewers to join the fun, the AHE invites you to take $5 off a print or digital membership with the code learn to brew 21 that's learn the number 2 brew 21 uh, visit homebrewersassociation.org/lthd to learn more and get involved that's homebrewersassociation.org/lthd welcome to basic brewing radio for thursday october 14th 2021 i'm james spencer here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Peter Simons, author of Guile Brews, walks us through the techniques of making two worts out of one mash and using brewing software to blend them to make delicious beers. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. If you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and fa- uh, find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. Boy, this month is speeding by. Still warm around here, but uh, some of the leaves on the trees are changing. It's my favorite time of year. And you might, I don't know, depending on how sensitive this microphone is, you might be able to hear it raining in the background. There's something we needed for a long time. Now from weather, we move into... <laughs> Let's take a quick look into the mailback. Last year, about this time, Dan from Tasmania, Australia, wrote about his ambitions to make ciders. Uh, well, Dan wrote me a, a few days ago with an update. He says, we ended up finding three enormous apple trees in the nearest town to us, owned by a lady in her 80s, her son, who makes cider and could not could not use them all, so we got to take everything else in exchange for cleaning up her yard to keep the possums away from the rotting windfalls. <laughs> so uh, she, Dan says she knew that one of the trees was a Cox's Orange Pippin she purchased from the local market as a bare-rooted tree obviously some time ago. Dan says, needless to say, we had a lot of apples, probably about 20 wheat sacks full. I enlisted my three child laborers to chop and juice them as we don't have a press. Uh, original gravity was 1050 and final gravity was 1001, <clears throat> so it fermented uh, pretty dry. Uh, Dan says fermented with the USO5 and nothing else. Then force carbonated after six weeks in primary and one week cold crash uh, turned out a lovely clear straw color. Fresh apple juice nose with a slight tartness right up front and a bit of sweetness on the mid-palate, and then a dry apple finish. Mmm, that sounds really good. Only the third cider we've made, uh, I must say this is excellent, Dan says. Hopefully we can source the same apples next year. Well, how fun is that, getting the family involved and uh, making some delicious cider? Dan sent me a picture of a cider, and it's, and it's beautiful. And, uh, you know, it's getting to be spring in Australia, down there, and, and Dan says he's going to try to grow some chilies and, and ferment them like I've been doing in the uh, Patreon bonus uh, videos. Well, up in this half of the world, as I said, it's fall, and uh, it's, time, it's time to start thinking about making some ciders. And, you know, the, the, the seasonal strain from Imperial Organic Yeast, the current one, has got you covered. A40GF Bubbles is a traditional cider strain. Bubbles is a beautiful strain for fruit juice f- fermentations. The uh, clean profile of the yeast, especially when used at the lower end of the temperature range, allows the nuances of the fruit to be prominent in the finished bubbly beverage. The strain is produced on 100% gluten-free media. Uh, Imperial yeast doesn't recommend the strain for use in wort-based fermentations, but, you know, if you're industrious like Dan and uh, you get a bunch of apples and put your kids to work and juicing them, or even pears uh, this fall up here in the Northern Hemisphere. Think of Imperial A40GF bubbles. You know we love Imperial with those 200 billion cells in each easy-to-open package. My stir plate is dusty because I don't make starters anymore for moderate-gravity 5-gallon batches. 
and my airlock is usually bubbling before bedtime. Ask your local homebrew store about Imperial Organic Yeast and check them out at imperialyeast.com. Well, a few days ago, I got a note from Peter Simons with a link to a YouTube video that he had produced showing how to design party guile recipes using brewing software. It's kind of tricky, you know, because you're, you're dividing up the fermentables from a single mash, and then uh, the way Peter does it, he blends those two words uh, proportionally to create custom brews uh, to meet your specifications. Well, I had a lot of questions about the specifics of uh, how Peter's brew day actually works. Peter Simons, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Good day, James. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Well, not too bad, considering. <laughs> considering being the operative word. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we're uh, we were we were commiserating uh, before we turned on the uh, the recorder that uh, you know talking about. Uh, Lockdown life, and uh, you know how our different cultures are, are handling the uh, pandemic on on opposite ends of the of the world here. Uh, so, but but video conferencing is is in now, so we're we're all cool. Yes, yes, but I I I guess um, New South Wales has a uh, has a long history of practicing um, lockdowns and curfews from previous times as a penal colony um and the and the present government have um, reinstituted um, a few of those old school uh restrictions <laughs> <laughs> well i'm not i'm not going to comment on our situation up here so it's just <laughs> just for yeah it, for it my just own would be nice it would be nice that we were bc before covid when things were somewhat saner amen amen uh, well, we're 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 going to we're talking about guile brew. The name of your most recent book is called Guile Brews, uh, and we're talking about party guile brewing. Uh, gu- you're spelling guile G U I L E on the book, uh, but it, normally when we talk about party guile, it's G Y L E. Is there a difference, or should we care? Well, you should care a little bit because um, guile. Uh, G-U-I-L-E, uh, was the way it used to be spelt. Uh, we're around um, 1800, turn of that century. Uh, spelling was, was different then. It was much more optional. Uh, so guile being a uh, G-U-I-L-E, uh, I thought that was a um, a sneaky sort of double entendre shall we say because guile today means crafty mm. and to be able to um do crafty brews you need to do guiles and guile being a, a batch of um batch of beer uh from one mash so all the all the brewing books that i've seen uh, have had the word guile liberally sprinkled in i, I think they bought books by the by the dozen so whatever they they did in subsequent years they still always had guile written down and and perhaps that's um how it's perpetuated and if you drink enough of of beer you can become beguiling for just a little while (laughs) beguiling very good that's the title of the next one there (laughs) no charge (laughs) oh thank you thank you excellent (laughs) but these are historic uh, UK recipes, right? Or, or uh, in that region of the of the world, uh, these are beers that uh, that you have done quite a bit of research. And we've talked about the book on a on a previous episode, uh, in what seems like a short time ago, but I know it's it's been a long time ago. Uh, but these are are beers that you have uh, re, uh, revisited. And uh, resurrected, so to speak, and and uh, you know have, have breathed new life in, and some of these techniques also, uh, you're not only bringing up to modern brewing techniques, but you're using uh, computers uh, to uh, to execute them as well. It's it's a difficult concept. I I think people are, are genuinely quite intimidated by the whole idea of a of a party guile process. In 
in in essence, it is a multiple beer approach. And to be able to do that, you do need some tools to be able to um, uh, work through your recipes, work out your overall gravities uh, from all the beer you're going to produce. And then you need some technology uh, to assist that. And I use Brewfather. I used to use Promash. Uh, the concepts are generally the same, uh, but you have to learn the program to be able to do that. Uh, and then you've got to deal with... you did, you, So you get a theoretical uh, expectation of what you're trying to do. One of the benefits of having uh, researched so much is I've got actual examples of 20th century party guiling. And from those examples, you can, you can scale them uh, and convert them to uh, a homebrew size batch. So at least you've got uh, an outline as to what you expect to get. What you actually get could be a bit different, and that's very much system related. Mm -hmm. But you can compensate for that. But you do need, I think, a bit of a plan to begin with uh, to be able to estimate what you're trying to do. So I've based it very much on uh, the actual historical record, but that provides uh, a platform for other experimentation and doing different things. Uh, the, the party guiling is a relatively recent in historical terms, a relatively recent thing, uh, probably began uh, in late Victorian times. Uh, once you had uh, sparging technology available, it meant that you could industrialize the way you brewed. Now, now Fuller's is very much a uh, the exemplar of um, party gal brewing because they still do it today. Mm. What happened prior to that? and a lot of people focus on that in the in the written text that I've seen, is that they basically did no sparging because they didn't have the sparging technology. So what you would do, you would mash once, run that off, that was your first beer, you know, after you boiled it, etc. Then you would you would, would flood the, the, the grain and the grist again and run the next one off and the next one off. So you ended up with perhaps three different beers of different strengths. Now they could have blended those together, but mostly uh, the historical texts that I've seen seem to have treated them as separate beers. What, once you got to the the situation that you could sparge, it then meant that you could uh, run off, say, from two mash tons to uh, a copper. Now, I suppose I ought to explain. Um, in in UK terminology, a copper is, and used to be, actually made out of copper, is the boil kettle. So copper equals kettle, kettle equals copper. So when I talk about coppers, think kettles boiling, etc. So what you would have is first mash, you'd mash that one, uh, run that off to your first copper, you boil that first copper, then you sparge the mash again. And once your first copper is finished boiling, you then run uh, the wort from into the second copper, which is obviously going to be much lower gravity, and you boil that one. And then the art then comes into how you blend those two wort streams uh, to make different beers. And that's the yeah. that's the uh, the uh, the twist that this book uh, to me uh, threw into my process because I've done what I called party guile brewing, uh, you know, a couple three times in the past, and what we've done is is just collected the first wort, uh, boiled it, and used that as one beer, and then collected the second wort and boiled that, added hops, and and made that a second beer. And never, never the twain should meet. We didn't blend, and so that we kind of missed an important uh, aspect of the whole thing. And so, you know, I was largely unsatisfied, especially with the quality of the second beer. But if I had 
uh, known that you were supposed to, you know, blend in some of the, the first wort into the second and vice versa, uh, then I think that I would have, been, would have been a lot more happy, you know, with the with the balance of, of those two brews. Yes, the... Um, the the textbooks of the time and the and the practice, as I c- can see from the brewing logs, they would always put some of the stronger wort uh, into. Let, let's say we had a uh, a strong bitter, an ESB or something like that, uh, and a uh, ordinary bitter, say a Chiswick bitter or something like that. Then the Chiswick bitter would always get uh, a fairly decent proportion. Of the first word because it uh, the book I read it said you run the probability of thinness now was that the sort of thing you were having a problem with because you you've you've not necessarily got all the dextrins and and other components from the the stronger word coming through in the final beer yeah that's exactly right uh, and I, I compensated, I think on the last batch, I compensated by adding some uh, some dry malt extract, uh, but still, and, and then some specialty grains to, to change it into a dark beer from the light beer, which was the first uh, runnings. Uh, but still, you know, it wasn't exactly what, what I uh, had anticipated. Um, and so, you know, since reading your book, I, I said, well, Steve and I need to get together and do another uh, another party guile session, and and then you know this global pandemic happened. So <laughs> that's what I'm blaming, my, you know our our uh, our lack of progress, uh, mm. you know in that situation. But talk talk about your setup. You we have brew in a bag, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. But but talk about your system that you have at home that you use to to brew these beers. Okay, well I have a uh, a three vessel system. Uh, let's say they're 60 litres each, approximately. I don't know what that is in gallons. don't even know what that is in US gallons. <laughs> so they're, 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 they're a decent size. What I have is a hot liquor tank, because you need that for the sparging. I have a mash tun, which I uh, recirculate using a Herms. And then I've got a copper. And it actually is a copper because it's a converted washing copper. Hmm. But it's made out of stainless, just to confuse everybody. <laughs> so the sequence is, is fairly straightforward. Uh, you mash in and you've calculated the, the gravity points that you want from all the, of the beers you're going to produce. And then... You can choose how strong that first word is by the volume that you choose to run off. Mm. Now, I'm talking a three-vessel system, not a brew in a bag at the moment. Right. The more you run off, the less uh, gravity you're leaving in the grain, if you like. So you'll have a stronger first word. So you boil the first word. Now, you do need to consider the hop rate of copper one and copper two. You you're going to have a strong wort. Perhaps uh, when I did a, a Murphy's um, uh, stout, the first runnings I got from that were in the order of um, uh, 10.74. And you need to have a hopping rate that suits that. So you tend to have to put uh, two-thirds of your total hopping into the, uh, into the first boil and perhaps a third in the second because... The, the second one came in at around 10.25. So obviously you get much better utilisation uh, in, the, in the weaker wort. Mm-hmm. And then you blend. Now, now my question here is, is kind of a, a one of technique. So you've boiled your first, uh, your first wort in your, in your copper, in your kettle. Mm. Uh, two questions. First off, the, do you then add the sparging water or the second water to the mash tun at that point and let it be sitting during the boil? Right. So sequence-wise, yeah, well, the answer to that is yes. So sequence-wise, if you have, uh, say it takes you about 60 minutes to, high, 
to to heat up your strike water. Then you do your first mash. Let's say that takes overall about 90 minutes by the time you've you've put that into the copper. Do a nominal 60 to 90 minutes boil. Once you've got the boil underway, then you sh- your sparge liquor should have come up to temperature and then while it's boiling away merrily, you can then run your um, sparge water in on top of the grains again, give it a good stir, recirculate, and let it sit there for another 60 minutes. So the the remash, the sparge mash, if you like, is happening in parallel with the boiling of copper one. Okay. And once copper one is finished, and what I did with the Murphy's one, I went no chill, so I put it straight in a cube. So that cube was my intermediate vessel for blending. That freed up the copper, so I ran the um, uh, ran the the weaker wort into the second copper, uh, and then chilled that down. So I had an intermediate vessel from copper one. I had the copper two was just sitting there. And then I knew both gravities of those and I knew what the volumes I had at the end of the boil and then I could work out my blending. And so I'm assuming that the, you know, your, your, your wort from the, fer- both worts were still hot. So I'm assuming that the, the fermenters, did you wait until the next day until the wort cooled down or, or do you uh, rack and blend into fermenters that are heat tolerant at that time? I let it sit overnight because my fermenter at the time at the time were plastic. Mm. So yeah, that's a good point. So uh, by letting it come down to temperature overnight, no chills a fairly recognized technique. Uh, then it was really a question of um, you had the volume, you you knew what your your uh, uh, temperature was so that you could compensate for any um, uh, shrinkages and all the rest of it. Uh, you had your, I had my theoretical calculation, which didn't quite match what I ended up with, which is perfectly normal. Uh, and then I blended and I added in a bit of um, uh, additional liquor just to hit the correct gravities that I wanted. So yeah, that that's how I I I've done about I've done about three full on party gals, uh over the last couple of years, uh, and that's that's about that method works. Uh, if but I did three different beers. If I was going to do the same same beers each time which I know is a, an anathema to homebrewers, um, uh, I think I would have it dialed in. But I didn't. I went straight for something else. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we tend not to have uh, good uh, uh, attention spans when it comes to brewing the same thing over and over again. Uh, well, there's always room for improvement, isn't there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and your ingredients change and... Uh, I've changed my system a few times, uh, but that I think would be a a fairly fairly decent way of going about it. Now, what what you actually choose, you, you could do perhaps a a different technique uh, if you had stainless steel fermenters, in which case you could probably uh, just run the wort straight in there and. Um, and blend from that. That might be a bit more elegant than um, uh, than using uh, no-chill cubes. You know who can help you put together an excellent system to brew your party guile beers and every other beer you want to make? Our friends and sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. I've got a single vessel brew in a bag, Warthog electric system, and Steve does as well. His is smaller than mine. <clears throat> But you can go beyond that and save money at the same time. Do me a favor. Go to basicbrewing.com and click on the ad on the right-hand side of the page that says High Gravity Basic Brewing Code Deals. 
And that will take you to a special page on HighGravityBrew.com that has a long list of Warthog systems that you can save 75 bucks on by using the code EBC75BB. There's the terrific Build Your Own Brewing System page, the Warthog two-vessel systems from 10 gallons to one barrel, Warthog three-vessel systems available in both Herms and Rims configurations, uh, of course, single vessel systems like mine and Steve's, and standalone Warthog controllers if you already have the other components to set you up your electric gear. HighGravityBrew.com can help you take the pain out of propane by going electric, and the code EBC75BB can save you 75 bucks off your new Warthog system. Check out all the terrific gear and ingredients and kits at family owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. Dot com. That's HighGravityBrew.com. Now, we've Steve and I have um, uh, brew-in-a-bag systems, electric systems, and I looked back and watched a little bit of the video, the latest video that we did, the uh, latest Party Guile video that we did, and we mashed in my system, ran off the first wort into his kettle, uh, and then he started the boil of his his brew, uh, and then I used my kettle as the second mash ton and, you know, fiddled, fiddled with the mash uh, in that way. Uh, so using brew in a bag, we were trying to to figure out, you and I, how you could do party guile using your t- blending technique, using just a single vessel system like brew in a bag. And I don't know that we figured that out, but you found uh, – Instructions from was it 1811 for a single vessel uh, system in in doing party guiles? Yes, uh, although they uh, they wouldn't have called it party guile in those days. It would definitely be G U I L E. Uh, yeah, they they um, they painted a uh, what looks like your your grandfather your um, single vessel. Um, Brew in a bag system. Uh, their their technology was coal rather than electricity, mind. Uh, but the the fundamental ideas of having perforated plates, being able to mash in the one vessel, uh, it was a really interesting um, interesting find. I found the eighteen twenty one. Uh, it's like the user manual it was a bit more elegant. The the 1811 version implied that you weren't mashing at all. But I think you were because the the grain was sitting in hot water for periods of time. It, but perhaps they meant by mashing the process of stirring, etc. cetera. Mm. So the, this particular uh, system, the patented portable brewing machine, <laughs> uh, what, what they were able to do was uh, they use like I was talking about the no-chill cubes, uh, they used wooden trays of suitable capacity as their intermediate storage. So so their process, they did a first mash, they ran off to the cooler. Now, I guess you could use um, uh, an igloo-type, use a brand name, but, you know, Mm -hmm. an insulated vessel, vessel for that. So when they they put their first wort into that, they covered it with hops, and then they kept on mashing in the single vessel, and they ran that one off to a second cooler. They put the first wort back into the single vessel, boiled it, put it back in the cooling tray to cool. Then they put the second wort back in on top of the uh, reused hops, which were trapped with the perforated screens that they seem to have, did the boil for that one, put it in the other cooling tray. So now you've got two cooling trays full of finished beer. Hmm. But wait, there's more. (laughs) They cleaned the first vessel and put the cooled first wort back into there and pitched the yeast in it. So not only was it not only was it a, a a the mashing and boiling vessel it was the fermentation vessel as well <laughs> wow they weren't that they weren't that so that's the strong wort in there 
the second wort was just put straight into a barrel, pitched with yeast, and allowed to ferment. So perhaps taking some some cues from uh, 1821, if you used uh, an insulated cooler or two of them to store your first wort and second wort, I'm not sure I'd advocate um, fermenting in your kettle or copper, uh, but you could see a potential way of, of, of doing that using a single vessel system. What I'm not sure about is, is how your efficiencies might work with that, with that system, with the brew in a bag. I, I would guess that the same rule would apply if you, uh, you would not want a sparge. Mm. You'd want to make sure that you left residual gravity in the grain in the bag right uh i guess but it it definitely needs uh somebody with some you know video capacity to uh, <laughs> prove or disprove whether that might actually work or not now the 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 igloo people i think they they got nervous when they heard people were using uh using their products as mash coolers so they they would they might be even more nervous to 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 hear people you know pouring boiling uh, work. Well, no, it wouldn't be boiling at that point, would it? It would it would be mash temperature. That's uh, right. To okay. go, yeah, it would, still, it would still be mash temperature. Uh, oh. So, but yeah, I I I would get nervous. And, and of course, you got the no chill containers, the cubes, uh, or the jerry cans, as they're also called. And you I, you know, I guess theoretically, you could move your word around with those. Although, you know, uh, please be careful dealing with large amounts of. <laughs> <laughs> of hot hot liquid as you're pouring things from back and forth they uh, they might actually be a better con- yeah, using um uh, a food safe um uh, cube mm-hmm. with pour- with a pouring handle would probably be safer than at at mash temperatures we you're quite right we're not talking boil temperatures and it will have will have cooled a bit in the cube um so yeah a, a cube i think um would be a way of uh, having that intermediate vessel, um, but I I, I uh, reciprocate with the um, uh, be careful because it's hot liquids and mm-hmm. all the rest of it. So how do you you've got and you've got a detailed video if you go to YouTube and search for Triton Books T R I T U one T U N books. On YouTube, that's your uh, your publishing firm. Uh, you've got a detailed thirty minute video on how people can develop recipes in Brewfather, uh, and I'm assuming that the same principles can be uh, transported from one platform to another. Uh, so, how do you to we do, we can't get into all the details on here, and it would be confusing if you did. But how Give us an overview of how you take one of these recipes uh, and translate it into brewing software in a way that works for home brewers. Well, it comes down to the the essence of of uh, doing a recreation recipe. Uh, you've you've got a whole series of um, archaic um, um, measurements, Fahrenheit, and um, things like that. <laughs> Couldn't resist uh, <laughs> pounds per barrel. Uh, so there's and there's a degree of um, interpretation and experience required to work out from an original uh, brewing record uh, what they were trying to achieve. Take that initially, and the great thing about where they were doing party gals, you knew what gravity they were getting out of the copper. So copper one and copper two, you knew what the outturn volume and the gravity was. You knew what the grist was. You sometimes were given the details of the hopping rate. The hopping rate tended to be two thirds in copper one and one third in copper two. And if you're really lucky, they would actually mention the times of additions. Mm. So all those, all those bits and pieces are, are good information. The particular record I used for the YouTube video uh, came from John Groves of Weymouth, and they identified uh, 
which sugars they put into copper one and copper two. Uh, and that's invert sugar and malt extract and other things. So it gave you a very complete view of what uh, parameters you, you had to deal with. So to scale that, you knew what the um, uh, gravities were out of the coppers. You turn that into a number of gravity points required for, let's say, a, uh, a nominal uh, 20 litre output. So five, five US gallons ish uh, of each of the two wort streams. Convert using percentages, uh, the grists, uh, convert the hopping rate, uh, looking at, at the pounds per barrel discounting for the age of the hops and, and other factors, uh, turn that into grams per litre, pop that into the recipe, or even ounces per gallon if you must. Um, that that gave you uh, an overall master recipe. That's all the work that you um, needed to produce to produce the two wort streams. So in effect, what you get from the old brewing book is... Here's wort stream one, that's the high gravity one. Here's wort stream two, that's the lower gravity one. So you've got two beers to work through, two, two wort streams. You then work through the software to produce the required outputs of copper one and copper two. You then put them into the blending calculator, which I've got an online spreadsheet for. That then gives you your blending options, making sure that you, you always put some of the stronger wort in the weaker wort, which is what they did historically and I think is good practice. Uh, add a bit of water or liquor, if you must, uh, to get the re required gravities. Uh, and there's your framework for being able to run your brew day uh, with a reasonable expectation that you'll hit your numbers. Mm. One thing that I ought to mention, and it's quite crucial, is that you really do need to know the performance of your system. So by performance of the system, I mean in particular your boil-off rate and evaporation, uh, that you've gauged everything, that you know what you're measuring is actually correct, which in some cases means uh, you should measure volumes um, uh, very accurately if you're using dip gauges or whatever. Obviously, your temperature measurements need to be uh, fairly accurate as well. Those sort of things that affect your, your mash efficiency will obviously flow through uh, into your outcomes if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. So you do need to, to adjust for your own system. Uh, and there's the basic platform for doing it. The magic is all in the blending. How you choose to do, I've gone with a, a very uh, historical um, approach as something that's relatively simple. You can then overlay on that. You could make a much stronger first wort. Uh, so you could be at barley wine strength and then have a, have a, have a bitter, or you could do a triple X imperial stout uh, and a porter. So you've got lots of possibilities. I didn't find anything to suggest that they were actually uh, doing this capping the mash for a different second running beer. Uh, what they did seem to use a lot of were brewing sugars mm. uh, as a wort extender. And that gives you a lot of flexibility as well. But really, we, once you've cracked it, you you should be able to produce uh, from perhaps only an additional perhaps couple of hours of effort, if that, by doing the, the parallel processing. Uh, you should be able to produce two beers at the, almost at the same effort, a bit more, but close. Uh, two very different beers. And then you've got all the options of fermentation. Mm different yeasts, different dry hopping regimes, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, lots of room to play. 
And and as you said, you're you you got to know your system, and you'll probably know your system a lot better after you attempt one of these because then you, you you're going to have some actual numbers to to compare. Uh, but would you when you're working the process, do you because of the character of the beers, do you prioritize gravity over volume, or are those kind are those kinds of decisions? You know, do you have to make those as you're working the brew day? Well, if you're working on a uh, intermediate uh, vessel approach, you're probably constrained by, let's say, the size of the of the cube. I mean, if it's 20 liters or whatever size that is. So you might have constraints. Uh, it is better to mash a few points higher, which is what I did uh, in the ones that I, I experimented on. I made sure that I had more gravity than I thought I would need at the beginning. So I had more grain. Uh, in case I lost, I had more losses from unknowns mm. later on. And that, that seemed to work. So if you get to the maximum capacity that you can of your mash ton, that's probably a good thing. That'll give you more buffer and more wriggle room. You'll know what your um, initial gravity into copper one is. And if that's on a bit of the low side, then perhaps you have to add a bit more brewing sugar into that one to, to or more extract or something just to lift that up. It, if you're going to make two quite different gravity beers, you do need to make sure that the differential between copper one and copper two is probably 20 or 30 points. Mm. Because if, if, if you get them too close together, you're really just fiddling at the edges i guess my i guess my my thinking was if say you know using my experience if if the if the gravity of the second wort was too low uh, you could sacrifice uh, in addition to adding sugars you could sacrifice uh, some of the volume by boiling a bit longer uh, you know and driving up your gravity points that way now now that that would mean that you would have to re-enter your figures into the blending calculator because then those would be different um you know but that's but that's one strategy that you could use to kind of uh fudge if you if you didn't get the numbers that you wanted to you know from the first attempt I, absolutely the the there's two phases to this there's the recipe design and the planning and what you think you'll get to be able to blend to get your outcomes then we draw a line under that bit. Then you go and do it, and you take measurements as you go, most important. Then you end up with copper one and copper two being different gravities and different volumes. So you replug that into the spreadsheet, and then you then you start adjusting. Uh, so you you've got a planning phase to give you to get you in the ballpark, and then you've got a practical application of what did you get. And and if your gravity sample of, of copper two is not right, then yeah, obviously you could boil a bit more, you could you could add a bit more extract, uh, or you could live with it because you could just fiddle with the with the blends to suit. Mm. So yeah, I, it it is quite a flexible system. Our friends and sponsors at Gronfell and Havoc Meaderies now have exciting mead starter packs. Not familiar with the delicious craft meads? Check out the classic mead sampler at Groenfell.com. It's got a four-pack each of Groenfell's Valkyrie's Choice, Old Wayfarer, and Nordic Farmhouse. Or, if you're if you're a bit more adventurous, go with the modern mead sampler with a four-pack each of three Havoc meads, Psychopomp, Root of All Evil, and Hop Swarm. Now, Root of All Evil, that's got some ginger in it. And, and is delicious. And Hop Swarm, of course, is dry hopped. Each starter pack comes with a free mead guide and a cocktail recipe card and, and free shipping across the country. And you'll also find some fun mystery swag tossed in there, too. 
Ricky and Kelly want you to step into the delicious world of Kraft Mead like so many other certified mediacs who are already on board. Check out all the tasty honey-based deliciousness at Gronfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. Now, you talked. You mentioned uh, brewing sugars, uh, and you sent me a photograph that you had gotten a, a bottle of uh, dark Cairo syrup, uh, but I never heard if you used it or not. Did you do anything with it? Yes, I did. I made a, a mild with it. Um, it's very fermentable, not at all like my experience with making, say, uh, invert uh, number three. And the darkness didn't seem to translate into the final beer color. Uh, overall, I was a bit disappointed. <laughs> I've still got half a bottle, half a bottle left. So uh, I think you call them pecans, but I call them pecans. Um, it, it it might end up in a beer yet, but it, uh, Plan B might be the um, might be the dessert. Well, the, well, the, yeah, pe- I, the pecan pie recipe on the bottle is excellent. So yeah, you can't lose with yeah. that for sure. <laughs> yeah, it um, I, it it lacked for me the um, you, you, with a good quality invert using um, the molasses and the molasses with the licorice that it imparts. I like that licorice tang in the background, and Mm. obviously the Cairo syrup didn't have that. But I did give it a crack, and, um, yeah. (laughs) It gives me an idea what you were tasting on the... um, On the sampler uh, show? At my recipe, Oh, (laughs) well, we did that. I I wasn't going to bring that up. You started... (laughs) Well, on the on the recent uh, on a recent episode uh, uh, that you may not have gotten to yet, we did a a sugar sampler where we compared uh, dark uh, molasses with dark hero syrup and uh, hungry jack pancake syrup. Uh, and guess which one we like the best? The one with the molasses. No, we like the pancake syrup the best. <laughs> I I can't see you, but I can hear your eyes rolling as you. They were, they were, they were spinning, <laughs> spinning pancake syrup. And you know what I did today? My wife and I uh, bottled uh, a five-gallon batch of a of a uh, Belgianish, uh, what I'm calling a a, a double, a, a hungry jack pancake uh, syrup uh, double. And you know what? It tasted pretty good going in the bottle. So. <laughs> Does it taste of pancakes, though? No, no, it's a, it doesn't taste buttery. Thank goodness. There's a little bit of a of a maple uh, uh, flavor in there, uh, but it's just kind of a. It, it, we found that it, and maybe because they put all the artificial flavors in there, <laughs> but it was more more complex of flavor than the uh, certainly than the Cairo syrup. Uh, but uh, you know, and and I know that it, Vermonters are going to get really mad at me uh, for for not using just you know maple. Uh, maple syrup from you know from the tree, but but you know we made a delicious beer with maple syrup. You know we've done that before, so we we decided to do well this and 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 let alone the Canadians. Oh yeah, yeah, but yeah. they but they they you know they won't be outwardly angry with me. They'll just be you know <laughs> they're too nice quietly quietly. <laughs> That's right. Quietly. <laughs> They'll say something. Think, they'll say something that they think is offensive toward me, and I'll. It'll. I won't even recognize it as an insult. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I. I think the Cairo syrup um, would go in if you wanted to do a um, a Schwarzbier or something like that, mm, uh, mm. Uh, where it would give some color and and just dry it out. Uh, if you're in a, as I was making a, a low gravity mild. It it just was too insipid. It, it, you want something with a bit of character when you've got such a low gravity of um, ten thirty five. I think it was. Oh wow! Yeah, sure. Well, there you go. You know, now now we know. <laughs> but but do get to, do make the pie though because it it only and it only takes you know just a short amount of time to make a delicious pie. Right, and it's right. super super easy to do. 
just, you just... I'll have to put it on my on my list. The um, I've made um, in the last this this whole lockdown thing has been going on for so long now. Uh, my my sourdough skills are um, are up several notches. Uh, my cakes are not too bad. Uh, I made clotted cream the other week. Uh, I suppose I could do a dessert. Mm, yeah. Boy, uh, just my crumbles. My crumbles not bad. <laughs> Lots of practice. I hear an ointment. You know, <laughs> I can recommend an ointment that's good for the crumbles. I... Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> well, well, Peter. Uh, any any last words? Uh, any last words of nuggets of wisdom uh, when when uh, designing these uh, party guiles and and. Uh, you know, other than get your book Guile Brews and go and go to uh, Triton Books on uh, YouTube to watch your your videos. Well, they're all good things to do, <laughs> but the most important thing to me is to put aside that party guile is complicated. It is more involved, but you need to just do it. It's a bit like. Uh, triple decoction if you like where mm. triple decoction is something that i've never done i because i don't brew very many lagers i'm not sure i really need to it's one of those things that if you haven't party guiled treat it as a bit of a challenge as to how you can use your system whatever system that is uh, to be able to produce two quite different beers from the one mash so treat it as a challenge and and bring a friend. I think a friend would be good, especially if they had a portable one vessel system. <laughs> would probably make things quite um, quite manageable. Yeah, bring bring a friend who has a brew pot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, excellent. And no and, and no drinking during the brew day, of course. Yeah, of course not. Be responsible and take notes, yes. just in case you do accidentally drink a beer or two, and don't remember. What went into your recipe? <laughs> That's never happened. <laughs> of course not. Oh well, Peter, I, it's always a pleasure to to get together with you. I I'm always happy to talk to you about about brewing stuff. You're you always inspire me to to try different things. Sometimes I follow through. Sometimes I don't. But. <laughs> But uh, it's always a pleasure to get together, and, and uh, I, I wish you a, uh, a, a end of the lockdown soon. Why, thank you. Um, I think we're all looking forward to whatever the, inverted commas, new normal is. Mm. So, yeah. But thanks for having me on. It's been great. Um, hopefully it's inspired a couple of people to give Party Garling a bit of a crack. Excellent. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, James. Well, thanks again to Peter for walking us through that. It's a lot less con. I, I'm a lot less confused now. <laughs> and after our conversation, uh, Peter sent me a picture of two full no-chill cubes ready for blending. So he's back at it. Now, to find Peter's book, Guile Brews, Google Peter Simons, that's Peter and then S-Y-M-O-N-S, Guile Brews, G-U-I-L-E, Brews. And that'll take you to uh, the lulu.com page where you can order it. And look for the video that we talked about on YouTube by searching for Triton Books, T-R-I-T-U-N Books. A lot of, a lot of spelling in this episode. <laughs> if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say how do you write to James at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at BasicBrewingShop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check all that out at Patreon.com slash BasicBrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well, stay tuned. So long. <laughs>